and we are going to start the second one presentation in our program this morning that is going to be by Peter Sorger, a professor from Harvard Medical School, and I'll invite Luke Corey to introduce Peter. Awesome. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Peter Sorger. He's the uh, Otto Crayer Professor of Systems Pharmacology in the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School. He's also head of the Therapeutic Science Program, and his lab's research has really endeavored to computationally model and experimentally test biological signaling networks in order to drive mechanisms of action uh, in both disease and uh, therapeutic interventions. And so I think today we'll hear some really interesting things today about uh, his recent research uh, and progress in this field. So let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, is it, use a letter there. Give you back this one. <laughs> Okay. Does a little green light help? Huh? A little green light. <laughs> we'll go back to the beginning. No. So, <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna, for those online, <laughs> we're talking about microscopy here. So um, of, uh, of tissues. And so one method that we've used over the last couple of years is uh, is fairly routine um, optical, what's called thin section optical sectioning. And so here you see an example of what can be achieved in an archival specimen again. Um, and you can begin to see some of the sort of morphological features. What you're looking here in the upper left is a macrophage, which is reaching across in a tissue and touching a T cell and uh, undergoing a PD-1, PD-L1 suppressive interaction with that. We've done a series of uh, large scale reconstruction efforts, and um, those are shown here on the right with the colorectal cancer. Those have become serial section reconstructions become increasingly appealing, and it's shown us how much larger most tissue structures are than we thought before. So things that were thought to be highly localized, for example, budding in, the, in, in a colon tumor is often used as a diagnostic criteria. It's thought to represent little tiny buds sort of of metastatic potential. In fact, actually, it's just fingers reaching out from the front of the tumor that are cut in cross section. But what we're going to talk about today is some recent uh, thick section imaging and then some also use of, of light sheet imaging down below. And if you're interested, you can catch those other ones were published uh, last year. This one's available online and the last uh, is just being developed now. So one of the things uh, as we began to move to 3D imaging, and what I'm showing you here is some reconstruction of a standard five micron tissue section. So essentially all spatial transcriptomics and all um, multiplex imaging that's out there of tissues uses a five micron tissue section. As we began to get thicker and thicker, what we appreciated is actually almost no cells and almost no nuclei are intact in a five micron section. And so you can see a thicker section to the right with the intact orange. And we realized that on average, epithelial cells and tissues are between 20 and 30 microns long. Um, and so you actually need this substantially thicker section uh, in order to capture a whole cell. And I'll show you why that's significant uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, what an image like this uh, looks like is something like this here. We have um, what I'm showing here is a three-dimensional stack. It's uh, 106 uh, individual images that are taken. Each of them is done serially, so we have 55 different channels. And then we can also bring in, for example, in the yellow, things that are directly autofluorescent by using lifetime imaging. And so you get this sort of fairly precise morphological picture. What you're looking at here actually is the very earliest stage of a melanoma in the human human skin, a so-called melanoma in situ, this 
could, if this patient were lucky, go on to uh, full immune editing, or it could actually become an invasive melanoma. Regardless, it will have been immune, uh, removed as a part of immune surveillance. And so just to give you a sense of what one of these images looks like and the ability to look at a multicellular structure, what we've done is just zoom in on a couple of those channels here, and we can then pull an individual structure out. This is actually a venule. So this is uh, a part of a blood vessel from which you actually see transendothelial migration. Here we are reconstructing that blood vessel using fairly standard software. You know that it's functional because we can see red blood cells going through, and you can also see how relatively thin it is. Um, we can also see a whole series of immune cells. Here's a B cell, for example. So people tend to think of B cells as being round. That's certainly not true when they're undergoing uh, endothelial migration. And they're also not round uh, when they're in tissue itself. So cell shape is very, very different in a tissue setting um, than you would tend to get a sense uh, from, uh, from tissue culture or flow cytometry. The other thing we learned uh, is just how di densely packed tissues are. Uh, so here's an, just another example where we've taken all channels, and I'm just going to spin this. This is a region of an invasive melanoma. And what we find is that the average difference between cell membranes is less than a micron and that cells are very frequently, not surprisingly, stacked on top of each other. So one of the problems that both single cell spatial transcriptomics and all of these protein methods face is uh, adequately segmenting one cell from the next. There are a lot of algorithms to do that, most of them based on machine learning. But you can see from this kind of uh, projection, and I'll come back to it in a moment, that this is a fundamentally difficult problem when you're dealing with a two-dimensional projection of a tissue slice. So let's just look at that in one example. What I'm going to do here is take out a single dendritic cell and two T cells. This is densely packed, but we've taken all the other cells out for visualization, a top view and a side view, the side view being along the optical axis uh, of the microscope. Here you can see how we actually do that. It's 125 optical planes or so. Each plane is fairly thin. What I'm showing here is the so-called point spread function of the microscope, so effectively the light gathering capacity. When you run it on a conventional microscope with a single slice, you see what's over on the right there, one optical plane. Uh, a slice through any given section looks like what you see above, so pretty sharp, actually, and that's what you would see in a conventional microscope down below. And this is on a, a Zeiss LSM 980. It's a sort of state-of-the-art confocal microscope. One of the things that's interesting about microscopy is just how digital ha has become. A lot of technology advancement just as in proteomics uh, uh, more generally. For example, a microscope with 11 lasers, which three years ago was an entire optical table, can now be made into something a little bigger than, than, than a couple of textbooks. So let's just imagine that we had taken this three-dimensional structure and we went through and we made some five micron slices on it. So these are conceptual slices, but basically doing exactly what you would normally do to prepare this tissue. And we can then go through for each of those sections and we could say, what would we have seen if we had done a two-dimensional view? It wouldn't actually have been as sharp as this in a conventional scope, but nonetheless, the point is made. And this taught us three surprising things. The first thing was, very commonly, we would actually incorrectly phenotype these cells. And that was particularly true in the case of immune cells, where a lot of the critical uh, markers used for identification are highly polarized. They're on one end of the cell and not on the other. So if we didn't catch that end of the cell, we'd be wrong. The second thing is you can see cases, uh, particularly in, in three and four, where cells actually, as I mentioned, lie on top of each other in three dimensions. And so we assign the intensity from one cell to the neighboring cell and misidentify its type. And then one of the issues we've often had with antibody-based imaging, and you probably would see this with any uh, high-resolution mass spec on tissue as well, is that there's a lot of seeming noise. The signal to noise is not as high as we would like. And now we realize that actually in many cases, what we perceive to be noise is in fact foreground. So we see cells because of the presence of a nucleus typically, and then we segment them. But lying on either side of them are actually the cytosols of all the cells lying above or below whose nucleus we did not successfully capture. So uh, we actually have a very different perception now, technically, of signal to noise uh, in these type of images. So let me just show you what can be achieved, even if you're using antibodies 
um, against proteins which have been well characterized. Here you've got things like catalase, for example, and lamin, you know, seemingly um, proteins about which we've known an enormous amount. What we can now do it is actually go down in a tissue at single cell resolution and look at the morphologies of those organelles and their distributions within individual cells. So this would be an unremarkable picture if this was a tissue culture cell, but I remind you that this is a piece of skin taken out of a patient 10 years ago. And we can go through and actually look at all the different uh, immune cell types. We can recognize about 60 cell types uh, in these specimens. And we can even look at these cells which have been of particular interest therapeutically. What you're seeing below is a T cell called a TPEC cell, a precursor of exhaustion. And this cell is thought to be the primary target of, of anti-PD-1, PD-L1 immunotherapy. Um, again, always represented in the literature as round, never round in a tissue, because in fact, it's crawling between cells uh, and is in fact a highly elongated cell. The other thing you can get sense of here, and we've only started to do this, is the actual surface distribution of these proteins. And some of them you'll see are punctate, some of them are really uniform, and some live in individual islands. There's a lot of development of antibody drug conjugates at the moment and of bispecific antibodies. And those are going to be most successful only if the antigens are actually expressed in the cells of interest, and if it's a bispecific, if they're expressed in the same physical domain. And we find that isn't true for a significant fraction uh, of clinical trials underway. And that's led to a new funding thought for our lab, which is we could go out, we probably have to start one of those hedge funds, but we could go out and start shorting all of those clinical trials underway today uh, that are targeting cells which do not express the protein uh, for which the antibody drug conjugate uh, is intended. So here you get a sense uh, also of the ability to do interaction analysis. This is usually done computationally, but for today, I'm just showing this to you visually. And what we're looking at here is uh, at one of these TPEC cells, the so-called defector T cell, the ones that's supposed to be undergoing cell killing, and their direct interaction with one of these regions of invasive cancer, which you see here represented in gray. And remember, in each case, I'm just showing you maybe five to six of the 54 channels uh, of this image. One of the things that's most interesting in any kind of in, uh, sort of high resolution study is protein co-localization, because that allows you to begin to look at interaction of cells into organelles. And the one that we've been focusing on recently is between PD-1, the uh, measure of T cell activation and or exhaustion, and PD-L1, its suppressor, and you'll recognize the primary target of successful immunotherapy. Um, in lung cancer in particular, it's necessary to measure PD-L1 uh, levels by immunohistochemistry before you provide the drug, but it's considered one of the least reliable of all clinical assays out there. And what we've come to understand is, in fact, these proteins have incredibly different distributions in different cells, and the relative population, I would argue, is the one I'm showing you here, which is when PD-1 and PD-L1 are expressed on two different cells, and they've come within the smallest measurable distance in this type of method, which is around uh, 80 nanometers. And we would therefore argue that this is now a juxtacrine interaction between the cell surface receptor and the cell surface expressed ligand. And we would like to now enumerate those in general uh, in tissues. So what I'm gonna show you today is another feature that has emerged from this, which is uh, the existence of large numbers of po simultaneous positive and negative regulatory interactions, again, among proteins that are relatively well characterized and are therefore used for phenotyping of cells. So what you're gonna see is an image in which we have uh, a total of five cells. There's a dendritic cell, three effector or uh, helper T cells, um, and also a tumor cell, which is gonna be undergoing a killing reaction. And we're gonna zoom in on just a single part of this. And what I want you to notice are the sort of morphological features that we can use to begin to infer signaling activity. One thing we're trying to lay on this now is also uh, RNA expression that is possible at near similar resolution, and that would allow us to look at the next step in these signaling cascades. So we're going to look at um, a dendritic interaction with a T cell. That's where a cell actually reaches around its neighbor and samples antigens. Uh, that's been observed in vitro. We're going to look at a polarized granzyme B. That's where the killing reaction actually occurs because the um, the protease is being secreted and then take and, and then inserted into the neighboring tumor cell. And yet the, uh, the effector cell that's doing that is simultaneously undergoing a suppression re reaction that I described before by PD-1, PD-L1. So all of this is happening at the same time in the same place. And this is by no means uncommon uh, in one of these tissues. So an activate, repression, and kill 
all at the same time. So contradictory signals effectively being processed. So here we are just coming into a small region, again, of this uh, melanoma. We're gonna peel back some of these colors because there's only so many you can take. Um, uh, and then we're going to begin to, here's now a labeling based on the identification of these cell types. And again, you could imagine combining this with discovery-based proteomics, you get additional features of these cells. Here we're looking at the uh, dendritic processes from the left cell, uh, which, is, which is CD8, reaching over to the helper cell here, which is in green. Now we're looking at the cytotoxic T cell, which is actually also activated lag three, which is one of these critical T cell regulatory molecules thought to be a marker of exhaustion. This is now in green, the granzyme B being directly secreted along microtubules from the killer cell towards uh, the tumor cell, which is here labeled in MART1. And then, as I mentioned, surprisingly at the same time, we're seeing that this exact same cell is being suppressed by a simultaneous interaction with a dendritic cell shown here in yellow. So the goal of these kind of studies now is to begin to enumerate the sort of simultaneity and the possibility of interaction. This is in a tissue where it's relatively non-manipulable. And the thing we're now doing is moving this into organoid type cultures where you can begin to bring um, individual perturbations and peptides, for example. You can do this in mouse models where you can control the immune biology to a greater extent. And then the hope is you can use these correlation in morphologies to move between tissue and ex vivo experimental systems. Now, one of the things that um, we spent quite a bit of time doing is trying to capture that very first event in oncogenesis. And so you would think that the very first thing that would happen in, in these uh, early cancers is you pop up an oncogene, but in fact, there's relatively little evidence of that. In fact, what seems to happen is there's sort of an increasing generalized burden on these cells and then a series of epigenetic changes. Here we are actually looking at that very early transformation. This is now again a precancer and we see uh, the melanocytes, which should normally be well-organized, transitioning from their dendritic-like structure below to a compact structure and tend to the so-called pagetoid structure where they're actually migrating uh, in the epidermis. And we can associate that with a series uh, of different protein markers. And when we've done that, um, we've noticed several things. The first thing that was of interest to us was that the inflammatory reactions that occur when you begin to get early oncogenic transformation are really localized. So what you're looking at in the yellow dots here are the presence of interferon or response to interferon in these tissues. And you can see it isn't sort of diffuse across the tissue, but is instead in these little pockets that typically two to five cell diameters wide. And that's actually consistent with ex vivo studies that have been done under conditions of high consumption. So probably these T cells are pumping out the interferons and they're immediately being received locally again. And so you can actually have many different pockets, local pockets of biology within a region here uh, of less than one millimeter. There are actually two different things going on. We realized in, in this particular image, one of them is that Immune cells, which are normally restricted to the dermis, are now starting to migrate up into the epidermis. Presumably that's in response to this inflammatory biology, and that's the migration shown here. And in addition, and dangerously in this case, we're seeing the first migration of these transformed melanocytes below the what's dotted here, the dermal epidermal junction. So this is the first evidence of invasive cancer growth in this patient. And these are the types of events that hitherto haven't been really resolvable either in animal models uh, or in human patients. One of the surprising things about this is if we go through now and enumerate all of the possible lineage states in these cells, so in this case, again, we're looking at well-established lineage markers. You could imagine how adding additional genes would be helpful. And we asked, well, how many states actually exist? We had seven lineage markers here. And we found in the end that every single possible combination of lineage markers existed in a tumor which comprises only a few thousand cells. So it's as though these very early transformed cells have actually sort of broken free from their normal uh, lineage constraint and are now, and this one's imagining and anthropomorphizing, but they're sort of exploring a whole series of alternative pathways as they try to find one that gives them invasive potential uh, and then allows them to do that first migration 
below the dermal or epidermal junction. And exactly what does this remains largely unknown. We become increasingly attracted to hypotheses that were around 30 years ago, that it actually is the very breakdown in the tissue organization, probably the adherence junctions, uh, which adherence junctions, excuse me, which remember contain beta catenin, is actually among the very first observable events. So those are things that we would like to characterize both using these technologies and also discovery methods. So um, one of the things that one sees across human tumors in general is just an extraordinary degree of disorganization and entropy. So this is actually a relatively early stage um, um, melanoma metastasis. This is a metastasis to the skin seen on the left with the imaging that I've showed you about today. Um, and all those different colors tell you just how heterogeneous this tumor is. And one of the difficulties as we get a higher and higher plex view of human tumors is we see within any single tumor is almost all of the heterogeneity that we'll see on average among tumors of the same type. And what exactly that means is not clear. I am showing you here in that comparison between a protein image and an RNA image uh, here, a xenium image on the right side, which is 10x's near single cell resolution technology. Colors are not exactly the same, um, but you can see the sort of organization in, in a kind of gestalt way uh, is similar. So one of the things you can do is begin to ask, what, what does organization look like in space relative to gene expression if you have the two match? And what we're showing over here now is a xenium plot um, of individual cell types. Uh, and these are then expressed in a UMAP plot over here represented by gene expression. And what you'll see is this is a reasonably well represented gene expression space. It's not because of the sort of difficulties of this technology, it's not as tightly clustered as you would see with single cell sequencing, but we can clearly identify within that the major lineages, cancer lineages that have been described in the literature. And things like MITF high have to do with the regulation of melanocytes, NGFR high is thought to be the stem cell lineage. And yet those well-organized lineages in terms of gene expression space you'll see are completely intermixed when it comes over to the spatial distribution of those tumors. So th this is not a representation of the spatial organization leading to the question, what actually organizes these tumors in space? And for the most part, we don't know that yet, but what we see is it is macroscopic features. And the ones that I'm showing you here are the tumor invasive margin, the proximity of nerves, the perivascular spaces, and then the fact that tumors have all of these uh, little necrotic regions within them that are packed full of neutrophils, dying neutrophils, and therefore just incredibly abundant for cytokines. And so I think one of the things that this is showing that I think you would see in any disease process like this, and similar things even are seen in inflammatory bowel disease, is this sort of very complex spatial intermixing whose fundamental organizing principles we're only starting uh, to understand. If we actually compare a Xenian image, single cell sequencing on the top, uh, or single cell spatial transcriptomic on the op of an image down below, you begin to get a sense also of the difference in resolution. So whereas the upper methods are good for sort of gene set discovery, the imaging methods I've shown you today are primarily um, used to get at these morphological features. And I just give you one example. You can have NGFR high cells here that look like A and are sort of little cells, and you can get these crazy multinucleated NGFR cells here, and you can actually then go back and forth between the two spaces and begin to find genes that are morphologically associated um, with particular kinds of dysregulated uh, functions. And here's just an example of that. So let me just begin to close um, with a thinking about 3D on a larger scale. So one of the, the nice things about these high resolution methods I tried to show you is the ability to get at detailed morphology. But you know, the average tumor when we resect it from a human is several centimeters in diameter. And the question is, what this, these are solid cancers, is what about all the rest of that cancer? And for that, we've actually now begun to develop light sheet imaging methods. And so I just wanna show you those and then close out. So what I'm gonna show you is now an, a set of images, it's gonna be a, a, a movie, a set of images that were collected from a specimen that's about one or two millimeters thick. This is done with a light sheet imaging at a resolution that's approximately cellular. This has been around for about 10 or 15 years, but hasn't until recently been applicable to these paraffin embedded sections and typically is restricted to four colors. 
So what we're now trying to do is push high-plex imaging of, of human tissues. And what we're going to look at in the, in the upcoming animation uh, is going to be the relationship between the immune lineages and neural lineages because they're known to be cross-regulated. Um, and so you're going to see the macrophages in blue and uh, T cells in green. So here's just an example of that um, that we've recently reconstructed. Um, primarily in tub three, you're actually looking at uh, neurons that are reaching up. We're now getting right to the mucosa. So this is where you have the, um, the, the crypts of the colon. The, the lumen is on the outside here. The, 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 because of the muscle, it bends backwards. Um, here you're seeing the nerve fibers and now the pancytokeratin. And you can uh, now reconstruct these large scale structures in the tumor, ultimately the entire vasculature, and get this down to single cell resolution. And so what we think the future of these technologies is going to be is this type of imaging in the first phase to sort of orient you within a tissue, and then some sort of section type imaging for either discovery, transcriptomics, proteomics, or the type of imaging I showed you before. And therein, you'll be able to build a sort of more complete picture of the large scale structures, which seem to organize uh, both tissues and tumors, um, and also the detailed single cell properties. So just to conclude, um, one of the things we've discovered recently is no cells are intact in a five micron section. We think that's going to not only impact protein-based imaging, but also single cell transcriptomics, because you're chopping bits and pieces of the nucleus off. Um, it is possible to actually now do thick section imaging on routinely on standard microscopes. The main problem is data sizes. These are really big data sets um, on the order of several terabytes, and we're only learning how to process those. But within them, then we can see many of these phenomena that hitherto have been observable only in, um, in tissue culture cells, for example, juxtacurrent signaling. And then I've given a couple of sort of biological points down below that I touched on lightly, namely this incredible sort of state of disorganization that we see in the earliest tumors and the fact that uh, many of these phenomena are graded across the tumor and exist in localized niches. So is there any prospect of pushing any of this forward into a clinical into a clinical direction? And obviously, um, living in a medical school, this is a question that often gets asked. And it is interesting to note the following is precision medicine really has two pieces. One of them is diagnosis, and the other one is treatment. And I've estimated from uh, a Cubia, actually a, a big CRO, what the annual cells are each. And you can see that basically it's about 100 to 1 in favor of treatment over diagnosis. And despite the fact that in a kind of preclinical world, we all think of ourselves in some vague way as potentially contributing to biomarker discovery, the number of tumors in, this, in, in clinical practice that are actually treated with uh, precision biomarkers is, if anything, going down. It's remained about 8% uh, of diagnoses get a DNA sequence, and all the rest of them are based on an imaging-based technology. And as the imaging is, it, the demand now is to have smaller and smaller specimens, tiny little needle biopsies, for example, instead of resections, it actually makes these methods more and more difficult and actually non-suitable for most of the kind of profiling uh, that we're talking about at this meeting. Now, the thing you'd really like to get out of this is a companion diagnostic. There's the one for BRAF. There's the one for HER2 in breast cancer. And ultimately, you'd like to get at diagnostics um, that, that are where the mechanism is directly related to prediction. And I think that's the promise here, but actually uh, largely unrealized. And I will tell you that um, We've spent some time in the lab, and I'm only just giving you a gestalt here, and I won't take any more time, to try to think about how a discovery-type technology that I showed you could begin to inform a diagnostic technology. And what do you need for diagnosis? It's got to be much cheaper, it's got to be much simpler, and it's got to be much more reliable. And the very uh, first step we took in this was last year is to take a subset of what I showed you today and implement it in a machine that could do this in a single shot. Can't do the fancy 3D, can't do all the colors, but in contrast to the current practice of h and &E imaging alone, we think for about $500, it's going to be able to combine conventional histology, which you're seeing there in the little lens, with some version of high-plex imaging. And a major effort in the lab now is to try to do that. And you could imagine that the choice of the antibodies is critical, and the kind of work you're doing in this conference would be very, very valuable in deciding which particular antibodies to put into such a cocktail. So 
future maybe would be some kind of diagnostic discovery continuum. If you thought it was hard to fund drug discovery, it's impossible to fund diagnostics. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we're going to face a future where it is going to be possible to continuously monitor patients on these so-called multi-cancer um, uh, profiling methods that are probably blood-based. Most solid cancers are going to go into surgery, and that's where the opportunity lives, both for discovery that we're talking about today and also for a kind of optimized spatial diagnostic. And the research here could in the usual sense, flow into the diagnostic. But I think what's really interesting is the possibility now of tapping into these specimen flows, which are large scale in hospitals, um, in order to actually power research directly out of human cohorts. So thank you very much for listening. I want to thank um, the pathology colleagues who, who've contributed to this, particularly on melanoma. Um, we've our uh, center works more with pathologists than probably most other people doing spatial profiling. And that's partly because the Brigham and Women's Hospital has one of the most famous pathology departments in the world. Um, and we, of course, are critically dependent on software and data analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that really great talk. Well, Thank you. Really amazing to see the new advances in this technology. Uh, so let's open up. All with proteins you've heard about for years. <laughs> Let's open up to questions in the audience. Uh, thanks a lot. It's an amazing talk. Thank you. Um, so I have many questions, but uh, we'll start. So first, do you have some kind of quantitative estimate of the extent of uh, errors that we make when we look at five micron slices versus the 3D? Like how much of what we are kind of used to seeing is actually wrong because of the lack of depth of the tissue and whether you see a difference when we are talking about cell type markers versus cell state markers. Uh... Yeah, it's a great question. And the answer is we don't, we don't really have a, 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 a a sort of thorough analysis of that. We've only just sort of, this is a, you know, six months ago, we made this, this particular discovery I showed you today. What we do know is, um, is that, you know, the five micron, there are great advantages to five micron in the diagnostic setting. It's amazing what a pathologist can, can do very efficiently from that. So I think one way to think about it is that in general, the five micron section contains a kind of uh, you know, shadow on the wall and the kind of Plato analogy of what you're seeing in 3D. So one of the possibilities, something we're pursuing, is to actually use machine learning methods to learn what actually in 2D is visible in 3D. If you see a polarized marker in your 2D image and it's within the cell you think, that's a pretty good guess that it's there. If you don't see it, then be careful about calling its absence. And so we don't, if you think about it in, 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 in proteomic genomic methods, we don't generally call the absence of things, but actually in flow, that's absolutely critical for immunophenotyping. This cell is CD4 positive, but it's not CD8 positive, right? So the, the having low zero inflation and complete information is part of that. So I think we're gonna have to be cautious about those kind of things. Um, the other thing is just, you know, once you've seen something in 3D, um, you can imagine, even in your mind's eye, ways to reinterpret the 2D imaging. And in particular, the fact that there's often space between cells, that's just not true. That, that space is not there. There's no, no vacuum um, surrounding these cells. They're actually completely close packed. Uh, so I think that's some of the things. Now, you can imagine taking that background calculation and overlapping cells and actually quantifying how frequent that is. We're in the process of doing that. What I can tell you is this proves why segmentation is an unsolvable problem. You just, there's no algorithm that's going to be accurately able to segment a tissue based on a two-dimensional projection. Yeah, so, so that's all, exactly my next yeah. question. So actually the segmentation part, which is a challenge, especially for complicated cells like macrophages and fibroblasts. So is it then becoming much simpler in your analysis because you get the entire cell or you just have different types of challenges? Yeah, yeah. So it's, what's uh, two answers to that? One is actually for a human, it's actually much easier to be confident of these things. The problem is we don't have good machine learning algorithms yet in 3D. We will probably by, you know, next year. So for the moment, if I showed you, if you want to come on over and play with one of these images, you can be much more confident in the in the boundaries of a cell in three dimensions at high resolution because it's not fuzzy and signal to noise is much higher. So in principle, that should help quite a lot. Um, 
I think what we're going to do in, in the case of segmentation, we're just going to have to realize that around 10 percent, we think between 5 and 10 percent of the signals are in any given cell are coming from an adjacent cell. Uh, and this has actually been called lateral spillover. Um, it's been looked at a lot in protein imaging, sort of ignored in, um, in, in spatial transcriptomics, in part because even with xenium resolutions, only around 10 microns. Um, so probably what you're going to need is a deconvolution algorithm. So imagine a little mini version of cyber sort uh, running in each of those cases. Um, and we have methods, which we're happy to give you that, um, or we're just developing, but you're happy to see them, which are both fully supervised and fully unsupervised, trying to use morphology to improve segmentation. Fantastic talk. Um, I have a slightly cheeky question. How about 4D? And 4D, of course, being time. So I know that you guys look a lot at signaling as well. And uh, particularly somebody like John Albig, for example, recently has been looking at reconstructing our activity uh, histories from fixed uh, IF images. And I'm just wondering how you're taking, if you're pushing that forward as well and trying to capture signaling states accurately on the basis of all the markers that you're capturing. Because as you know, absence is evidence, it's not evidence of absence. So if you're not setting up this correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean that it didn't just happen like say five minutes before in the tissue. So how are you tackling that? And is that something that you're looking into? Yeah, so uh, two answers. One is we're collaborating with John. Um, uh, but so you're, the, the issue with the time series measurements is it's not at all clear how you would do those in a human tissue. So I think in a tissue setting, there's either synthetic time to which you allude, and that works with the cell cycle. So the cell cycle in principle, if cells are freely cycling, you can assume that you're capturing all these different states and you can then reconstruct that trajectory. And John has done some of that with signaling. The other possibility that we're doing now with Uli von Andrian's lab is actually to use intravital imaging. So you can use intravital imaging in the mouse, which is time dependent, usually only two or three colors, freeze a specimen, essentially fix it, and then subjected to high resolution imaging of this type. So what you'll end up with, and this has been done quite a bit in tissue culture cells, um, is you, you'll end up with a continuous time trajectory for a few molecules or a few cell types, followed by a deep fixed time look, and then you'll ha try to do some reconstruction. So time is the most obviously missing element here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Peter, this was a great talk, fantastic. Uh, so you. as you're pioneering all of these discoveries, I am wondering, but what about statistics? We are always trying to find differences among sections, tissues. How do you envision the statistics for solving this 3D data? Yeah, so what I showed you today was, lar was largely observational. So um, when we do 2D work, actually the statistics are leaving aside the segmentation problem plausibly good. We're looking at typically millions to tens of millions of cells. Um, what we don't have is a very sophisticated error model in those cases. So, you know, we don't, un we, we could use a simple statistical model, but in fact, we want to put something more sophisticated in, like if we see a CD4 with cytokeratin in it, unlikely that that cell exists. Let's have an error model that captures that as two cells overlapping. Those have really not been developed. In the case of what I showed you in 3D, we to the moment, we still see most things visually. And then we go back and write a customized algorithm to see, could we find that in 100 cells or 1,000 cells? So I would say that it's informal statistics. On the last, I mean, it's formal statistics used informally. On the last uh, part, actually, is a, on, the, on the clinical side, actually, it's a really big deal because it's sort of interesting that if you look at papers that pathologists publish on H&E imaging, 500 to 1,000 cases would be common in a case-controlled study. I couldn't even imagine scaling to that in proteomics. So what you have with omics in general, and this is true across all of human disease, is you have the big data sets with shallow measurements and then small data sets with deep measurements, and yet the deep measurement data set wants to have a lot more samples because you get a lot more free hypotheses. So the only way to, to, to solve that is to push down cost and push up efficiency. And you know the best example of that working is something like GWAS, right? GWAS was exciting and then it didn't go anywhere for a long time. And now you know you get to thousands and thousands of patients and the and the quality of inference goes way up. So we're, we're some ways away from that still. Peter, very, 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 very nice. You've you've un, you've unlocked um, uh, an information issue, and, and namely the 2D to 3D. So you showed a picture of the PD-1 and the PL, 
Yeah. DL1. And you told us that they were confocal. Now, of course, we don't know whether they're confocal in the image you showed on the screen. Uh, and so are you requiring now journals to always give uh, with a picture, a 2D picture, a orthogonal picture of the same from the same site to show that in fact that confocalness is real? Because as you presented the slide, um, I couldn't tell as a as an investigator whether those were truly confocal. You've now <laughs> you've now revealed that it's more complex. So how do you present that in a journal? Do you do have a, a two panel with one showing in one direction, another com, uh, orthogonal to it, or do you show it as a stereo pair? Yeah, it's it 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 actually touches on a on a great general issue, which is that uh, you know we buy million dollar microscopes, we take huge image sets, and then we publish a postage stamp, right? And the question is why? Why is that? So one way is to show a stereo pair, but imagine, you know, you, you know how to publish is once you've got your, how many papers have we all had where you get it back from reviewer three, you expand the paper by 50%, you do all the things, and then it all gets cut out during the editorial process again, right? So, so one of the issues is, is, is data sharing, is to make the data accessible in a usable way. And um, about 20 years ago, my lab developed the open microscopy environment, the OME uh, environment, and that Gowden's, uh, sorry, Jason Swedlow now leads that, and it moved to Europe. It's just an unfundable project in the United States. So um, there's now an imaging data commons at the NIH, and it's avoiding this issue again. So I think proteomics is interesting, uh, sort of mass spec-based proteomics in the last five years or six years become much more uh, oriented toward data sharing. But g that sort of kind of genomics mindset, if you'll excuse it, where data has to be liberated and made available has not come to the microscopy field. It's infinitely frustrating. So we even have um, algorithms that you can get in your browser that are totally, you know, they, they run uh, out of Amazon S3 that would allow you to explore this data in 3D. And we can't convince any journals to make it part of the publication process. So I imagine it'll change. Um, <laughs> you know, the editors will all retire and somebody else will come along. It, it, does, seem, it does seem ridiculous because we can't go back and reevaluate these claims. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. I will send you the stereo pair for that one, though, if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, maybe a naive question. So when you say you did like 54 plaques, do you mean using 54 different antibody to stain the slice? slice? Yes. OK. So there, there are a couple of ways to do many antibodies. So one way is to is there are actually quite a few ways. One is to mix them all together and have 54 colors. There aren't 54 usable fluorophores, but that can be done with metal tags. And that's what the imaging mass cytometry type methods use, right? Everything's mixed together and then each one carries a different lanthanide tag. That would be a method like um, MIBI, for example, from Angelo, uh, the Angelo lab. Um, the issue with those are fairly low resolution. So in a microscope, you can, the, the Orion method where I showed you, and you can actually do 18 colors at the same time for, with various optical tricks. What we choose to do is do six, six colors at a time, and then it's a cyclic process. So a 54-plex image is actually built up from about 10 six-plex images with redundancy all the way through to make sure that things aren't screwing up. Oddly, if you do a cyclic process, the images get better and better the deeper you go into the image. And that's because the best way to blank block nonspecific binding is to use a really expensive <laughs> antibody in the earlier step. So, so the cyclic acquisition, though slow, is pretty reliable. And we tend to choose it because it's flexible. OK, so the, your antibodies um, already, for each antibody, you have an uh, individual fluorescence text, and you don't need to your secondary antibody just was only one antibody is enough? Yeah, so you can use secondary antibodies. For the methods here, we choose to, uh, to leave the antibody in place and inactivate the fluorophore photochemically. And in that case, you need a direct conjugate. So all of these antibodies are directly conjugated to a fluorophore. And then after each cycle, that's bleached essentially through a photochemical reaction.
Thank you. Yeah. And by the way, that's a fairly become a fairly standard method. So awesome. Thank you so much for this exciting talk and this round of applause. Thank you very much.